Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Culture War Podcast. This is our uh, not our last show of the year. We actually have another show next week, but that will that's a pre-record. So this one is going to be live, and we're going to be talking about Civil War, World War III, foreign policy, national security, and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, especially right now with, this is really funny, I did a search, because you know I love to, for Civil War, and one of the top stories was Donald Trump removed from ballot in Colorado. Nothing in that story referenced in any way Civil War, but apparently... What's up? Nothing. Nothing? We're good? Okay. Apparently, enough people searched for Civil War and clicked this story about Donald Trump's removal that there is a clear correlation here. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about a, a little bit of everything related to issues of uh, national and international security. Joining us today to talk about all of this is Eric Prince. Nice to meet you, Tim. Uh, nice, uh, nice to meet you. Who are you? What do you do? Um, well, born and raised in Michigan. Uh, Navy vet. I was in the SEAL teams for a few years. Built a business called Blackwater, a private military contractor. Sold that in 210. Um, moved to the Middle East. Uh, worked on a project that ended Somali piracy. I've done some investing in frontier markets since then. And um, now I've developed a new phone. Oh, cool. Right on. But needless to say, I think when it comes to issues of national and international security, you're, uh, you're an expert. I don't know if I'm an expert, but I have a lot of scars and I have a lot of experience and I've seen what worked in the many things that governments try that do not work consistently. Right on. We'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Phil Labonte is joining us as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Phil Labonte, lead singer of All That Remains, anti-communist, counter-revolutionary. Cheers. Right on. Well, let's just jump right into it. Uh, the easy buzz topic is, you know, with Donald Trump's removal in uh, from the ballot in, Col in Colorado, now there's discussions in California to remove him. They've already had uh, numerous efforts. There is once again, and and this has happened quite a bit, especially, you know, we talk about it, civil war trending on Twitter or X or whatever. And uh, a lot of people asking this question, especially with, I don't know if you saw the trailer for this new film that's coming out next year, Civil War. So, you know, not not to say that uh, you would be an expert on what's happening in the United States and, and predicting the future, but you certainly have experience in foreign countries. And I'm curious, just kicking off, the, kicking off this conversation, do you see any kind of analogs, correlations, or is there is there something you've seen overseas in military conflict that relates to what we're seeing now in the United States? Well, in 1860, um, 10 Democrat slaveholding states uh, removed Lincoln from the ballot, yep. which then resulted in a civil war when they seceded from the Union, which didn't want to uh, threaten slavery. So uh, it's, uh, it's a really bad practice for the Dems to try to do this. It is for all their claims of trying to protect democracy and the republic, it's quite antithetical to it. What I would say from a, a civil war corollary, I have friends in um, what was Yugoslavia, which kind of blew up as a country in 91, um, Serbia versus Croatia and Slovenia and Bosnia. And <clears throat> their experience was, it was shocking how quickly it, um, it went tribal. And, uh, and everything that people had expected to be normal stopped, whether it's utilities, water, electrical, food supply. Um, it, it rapidly devolved into an extremely violent uh, hell, which lasted for many years. So for people to say, ah, you know, <sighs> remember the, the first battle of um, Manassas, you had tourists that came out from Washington thinking that it was going to see they're thinking tourists from Washington thinking thinking they were going to see these rebels spanked um, by the proud Union Army and the reality is the Union got their ass handed to them that day oh yeah and and so people can flippantly say yeah Civil War and it's not something to be toyed with it's not something any of us should want because it would be a lot of people will die there would be an enormous suffering and this Yes, America suffers from affluenza. <laughs> um, yes, certainly. But um, uh, this can be solved at the ballot box, so it's not solved with a cartridge box. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think, you know, that, that, that's why I'm often, uh, I often say the last thing we want is violence. And in fact, I would argue that the people removing Trump from the ballot, these uh, establishment forces want violence. It, it, this is an act of desperation. Trump's skyrocketing in the polls. <coughs> 
You've got young people now swinging towards Trump in a lot of different polls, which is shocking. You've got Trump with a massive advantage in swing states among voters who did not vote in 2020. So tremendous advantage. Yeah, I think I think the ballot box is the path forward. That being said, you brought up the first point. Democrats in 1860 removed Abraham Lincoln from the ballot. They did not want him to win in 10 states, 10 states. And the reason was they feared it would be the end of slavery for them. You had, a, you had a, I think it was there was there were four candidates. Abraham Lincoln's position was no new slavery, but uh, officially he wasn't saying he wanted to end slavery at all. He was just saying in the new territories, as they become states, we will not allow this. There were there were other candidates. There was one candidate. I, I forget their names, but he's just like, no, nah, I'm not going to address the issue at all. We're going to ignore this one. There was one candidate. Uh, I, I believe the Democrat actually was like, we should allow it in the new territories. Abraham Lincoln was actually more of the like somewhat neutral. Those who have it can keep it for the new territories. We won't do it. The fear, of course, was he's full of it. The moment he gets in, it's going to be full scale banning of slavery. So, of course, they removed him. And then before he even took office after the election, I, I believe it was, was seven states seceded. And so this is before he was even president. So as, as much as I agree, there's, there's a solution there. There is still that fear historically that, you know, Donald Trump gets elected in November. And then I don't know about secession because that, I think that was a particularly unique circumstance in, in terms of history. But I, I, I fear that uh, come November, no matter what happens, we will not have a resolution to the, to the election process. No, look, the, one of the great things, when you look at the Constitution, our founding fathers were real geniuses because they, they foresaw so many of the predictable things that established vested interests would try to pursue. And, and as a country, we've screwed up the farther and farther we veered from what the original Constitution was. Think about um, direct election of senators. It used to be oh, right. it used to be that state legislatures uh, would vote for each senator, so that the senator was beholden to the state. Now senators are beholden to whatever the three to five huge interest groups that fund their their campaigns are. Terrible. Yep. In 1913, I I, I don't think we've grown Congress. The number of of legislatures uh, of congressmen still 435. That's the same it's been since 1913 when the country was less than half the size. So if we want a representative Congress, we, and as much as I hate to say it, we actually should add <laughs> more congressional people. Yeah. Maybe keep districts. their, maybe keep their staff size the same, but let them, instead of representing every six or 700, 800,000 people, make it 400,000. So they're actually much more responsive to smaller. And that would, when you look at the electoral map of who voted, um, uh, for which party, uh, rural and normal America obviously votes one direction. And in that, in the more concentrated, um, these, these, um, positions become in cities, less represented rural America is. Yeah. You, you were mentioning in, uh, Yugoslavia, for instance, that uh, it happened so suddenly it went tribal. Um, I, I don't know. Do, do, the, the, you're talking about these are your friends, but did you have any direct experience personally with like nations that have fallen in this way where that's like flipped overnight or, or turned into like mass chaos? Um, just that uh, it, 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 it's down to it, it, all the institutions that you expect to stay together withered. Militaries wither if someone's not paying the bill. So it comes down to a a a group of friends from your neighborhood or a soccer team of guys that you trust or the local fire department that's literally became the institutions that survived because it's closest to to where they where they're rooted so uh how, i think most of us we've all heard the name blackwater <coughs> how how would you describe blackwater you know like when you when you first started it and what its mission was and what it did what was it so i was a seal team guy for a few years in the 90s uh, really be before it became um, <laughs> so popular. But um, uh, at that point, you had the peace dividend and there was they were closing major military bases across the country on an almost monthly basis. And SEAL teams had been using private facilities since the 1970s because no one had, um, you know, Navy guys don't really have ground combat ranges. So I was, my father was a very successful entrepreneur. He died while I was in the SEAL teams. My wife got cancer. I got out. I built a training facility to serve the needs of the SEAL teams and those kind of units. And 
But knowing and having seen the awful, pathetic job that UN peacekeeping forces did in Bosnia, in Yugoslavia, um, built a facility. Um, it was uh, 3,000 acres, seven ranges, everything from a 25-meter uh, reactive steel range out to a 1,300-meter um, known distance range for snipers, shoot houses, mount facilities. After the Columbine uh, high school tragedy, we ended up building a huge mock-up of a high school because, wow. again, the police that came to that event didn't really go solve the problem. It, they took three hours to, for them to clear the, um, the high school. Um, we trained the Navy sailors after the USS Cole was blown up in Yemen. Uh, the Navy came to us. We trained almost 100,000 sailors nationwide how to defend their ships. So we answered what our customers needed. And then when 9-11 happens, um, we provided a lot of security overseas and aviation and security. And, and so we, you know, we, we filled the gaps that government forces could not fill. Private military contractor, is that a simple way to describe or yes. is that over simple, over simple, uh, overly simple? Uh, so there's a video game called The Division. Have you ever heard of it? Sorry, no. So this is uh, one of the Tom Clancy games. Okay. You're, you're familiar with Tom Clancy? Tom Clancy, of course. Great yeah. game. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the game The Division. Uh, I played one and two. I haven't played in a long time. The general premise is a biological weapon is released. It's been a long time, so forgive me all the deep Division fans. A biological weapon is released. You, you are in New York. You are part of a clandestine government uh, cell called the division that is activated after the president invokes directive 51 are, are you familiar with directive 51 very not deep lore for you so uh in 2008 george w bush i think it was 08 it might have been 07 uh signed president uh, a national security directive uh, uh was it national security presidential directive 51 which states that if there is a massive loss of life or economic damage or something to disrupt the continuity of government in the united states the president basically uh, uh, pulls in a national continuity coordinator who would then seize control and uh, create some kind of single branch government to try and maintain continuity of government or something like that. So that's, that's the premise of the game. You are one of these agents. One of the components of the game is there are four factions you fight as you're in this New York post-apocalyptic plague ridden place. And it's kind of silly, but there's like, gang members which makes sense i guess but then there's like firefighters like people who are in the fire department all of a sudden just like start taking over parts of the city i don't get that but uh there's a private military contractor and so these are guys with military gear you know camo high power weapons apcs etc and the general premise of the story is they were contractors for the government but once everything collapses they just go autonomous so pure fiction I suppose it's an exploration of what might happen. But to, to the reason I bring this up is to go back to, you know, we're talking about Yugoslavia. We're talking about everyone's got civil war on the mind. I'm curious, what do you think would happen with, uh, and I not necessarily like to say this of your organization or anything. Do you think there is a, a reality where like a private military contractor, not to try and stage a coup or something, but would just become autonomous and start securing certain areas, securing resources? Uh, the thing about... Um the way the U.S. government hires PMC support is it's for overseas security, protecting embassies, diplomats, key government facilities. Um, the idea of some standing garrison of PMCs in the United States it doesn't really exist because there's not a, a place where all these guys live. They live all across America. They are veterans that are either prior military or prior law enforcement that have skill sets and they go and do it on a part-time basis working overseas just like a an oil field worker uh as a roughneck goes and works on a rig for 60 days and then he takes 30 days home to tend his farm and then go back to the rig that's that's how the rotation is so there's an enormous pool of veterans out there uh and a lot of people with skill sets um it would take an extraordinary budget to try to hire them as a pmc Right, right. So I suppose this 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 view of, you know, uh, in the video game, you have trucks and all these guys and their information and you've a, a securing a part of New York. It's not the reality simply because when you guys contract, it's like you call somebody who might be in St. Louis, another guy who might be in New York. Is that how it works? Correct. I'll give you an example. When um, when Hurricane Katrina happened 
in 2005. <clears throat> As a company, <clears throat> we at Blackwater had never done anything domestically security wise, but um, we had just taken delivery of a helicopter that was set to go overseas. But, um, you know, seeing people on the rooftops, all the rest, I called our air boss and I said, send the helicopter. And they did. And by the time they made it, our, our aircraft had been retasked from being November 505 to being Coast Guard 505. They got a call sign and they extracted a bunch <laughs> of people working in concert with the Coast Guard. And then companies started calling Bell South and Walmart and insurance companies, et cetera, because the police had all left wow. the area. It was meltdown. And they said, please provide security. So we did. We surged 145 guys in 36 hours from five states away. And we got them licensed through the state of Louisiana. And then uh, they were there for about two weeks. And then uh, FEMA called and said, could you please provide security? Um, we said, well, don't you have federal police for that? They said, well, we asked the Federal Protective Service. And they said, no, their employee union said the conditions were too rough and wow. too unsafe. They wouldn't come. Could you provide police officers, like former police officers, to just guard these locations. And we ended up providing 700 for the next few months. There, there is a, a, you know, when, when people say the name Blackwater, there's scandals and people think of only the worst things imaginable, I guess. Most people probably don't know about the, the standard day-to-day -day operations or basic security stuff that you provided simply because of the news. And you know, you know what I mean? Sure. So like, I don't know. I find it interesting to hear that as, as uh, Katrina is really bad, but I'm, uh, I wonder, was it, relatively routine having guys come in security i know it's 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 extreme circumstances but i don't know how to describe it other than yeah did, did it was like that mission for you guys was it routine well it was not because we'd never done anything domestically and haven't didn't do anything since and and for all the i'll i'll, I'll cancel the urban myths now we didn't take anybody's guns away <laughs> and the only and the only discharge of a firearm our guys had while they were down there was one pit bull that was attacking some kids that's wow. it but so again, uh, the people that were rescued off the roofs and protected from, I mean, look, when our guys got to the French Quarter first on and, and got there before the Louisiana National Guard, there was bodies in the streets, not from the storm, but from the looters that had rampaged through the area. Wow. So it was, um, it was chaos and um, wholly unnecessary. So you when you first arrive is you're saying you're, you're you're coming in to provide security and rescue people and there were already people who had been killed by oh, yeah. what would you call them like bandits Lo looters looters just getting into fights over stuff yeah but i feel like looters not extreme enough i mean someone who's willing to kill another person you have to call them like a like a uh, you, a bandit arm, <laughs> arm, armed, armed looters armed gangs that had gone amok and there's barbarians even, if you look if you look back uh, even at the videos you'll see people looting stores yeah. and you'll see cops following them in looting as well <laughs> yo this is so wild. so, so you, know, you see but you see the apocalyptic vi you know videos of of things that spin out of control stuff like stuff that like happens. that happens it happened there trust that, me the stuff police like that. doing the looting sorry Phil, just real quick uh what movie was it recently where um uh what was it it's there's like it, it's a post-apocalyptic scenario I, th or I think it would have been the last of us the show they, the guy's going in, maybe it wasn't, he goes into the pharmacy, he needs to get some medicine for his kid. He sees a cop walk in and he gets scared and the cop looks at him and just runs, starts looting and then runs oh, out. Oh, yes. Uh, not 28 days later, no. Um, I know this, it, may, it might be one of the uh, one of the new remakes of the, uh, the Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead, one yeah. of those, but I know exactly the scene you're talking about. The and, cop, and you're 100% like, right. That's the, the, the thing is like, in a situation where you have the breakdown of your society or, or basically of, of law and order of authority, the police are going to take care of their families. Like if it gets into like, like you I know, said, it gets tribal. Yeah, exactly. Like, and so you've seen, have you actually been on the ground when like countries have like fallen apart or, or is it been more like close? Okay. So the, when you look at the United States and you see the, the political climate, like we talk about this kind of stuff all the time, but it's also a little bit of a of a you know it's a theoretical exercise I guess or or whatever but I can I often say I don't see an exit ramp because pe people keep making 
I, I think the incentives are aligned against making things better in the U.S. And do you see a similar scenario or do you see the kind of strife building here that you've seen in other countries or what's your take on it, I guess? Look, people need to be educated as to just how ugly that alternative, that those that those uh, scenarios. You and I both know young men don't care about that. Young men, if young men don't have stuff to, to busy themselves with, they 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 will rage and you know that you know that well i know i know you know that <laughs> that, that again people need to be reminded of the <laughs> the short term and the long term consequences of that kind of behavior cuz it's ugly yeah. and and um, that's an understatement i think that's the point that's why we really talk about ugly. it so much here is because of the i mean it's one thing to say i like my amazon deliveries right which is everyone likes the modern world but it's totally different to look at gaza and be like that is what you're talking about. When when you hear people talk about the Second Amendment and then they say, oh, well, you know, when the president says you would need an F-15 to defeat the United States, what he's talking about is turning neighborhoods into Gaza because men own rifles. That's what yeah. he's talking about. And that kind of talk coming from politicians is every bit as inflammatory as ta talk coming from podcasters or anything about you know or or even you know right-wing nut jobs or whatever you want to call talking talking volatile conversations i don't think people appreciate how much we all benefit from a high trust society absolutely that you I can that you can pay your utility bill at the end of the month that you can pay, no, seriously <laughs> that you can yeah. write a check and you know that the the check is going to get there and they're going to accept the check you or know. that you can mail a package yeah from a but to this b is, this I is mean, or that you can even go to the store without having to be gunned up in a three vehicle convoy mm -hmm. just to get groceries. I mean that's 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 the that that's the alternative that we're talking about when a high trust society collapses into that level of mayhem, that's exceedingly ugly. And I, you do not want that. I think it's probably true that a large component of liberal voters come from safe, high trust, affluent areas. Yeah. Or at least on the higher end in 2016 vox.com said that the democrats had become the party of the wealthy and 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 i think that's fair to say because these people don't quite understand what you're saying about how bad it really is michael malice brings this up even he, he's like even the stuff we talk about isn't as bad as it could be at when you look to history and authoritarianism dictatorship civil wars war conflict and stuff and things like that i everybody knows i grew up in chicago a slightly lower trust uh, area on the south side. And uh, it's funny because I certainly would never say that it was anything like war conflict that you've seen. But we we understand at least you had that lottery. I, I don't even call it a lottery tickets chance. You maybe even had like a 0.5% chance. Or maybe that's not fair. No, actually, maybe 0.3. That you could be shot at at the very least when you go to the store. So I would say on the south side of Chicago... Uh, going to sleep, you'd hear gunshots. For me, where where I was, a couple times a year, close to where your house was, in a dense urban area, bang, bang, bang in the middle of the night, and you're just like, I wonder what's going on. And uh, I've had friends who'd seen bodies being dragged through the alley. I don't want to make it seem like, you know, every day you go outside, you're running from bullets. But we certainly had, everybody had their story of someone pointing a gun at them or of uh, someone running on the street after being in a gunfight. Things like that, you know, put put me in a more moderate position in terms of policing and security. But then I look to a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, more affluent liberal types and they're like, abolish the police. We don't need it. I know. And I'm thinking like your wealthy white suburb will be the first to be conquered by barbarians when you no longer have security. Southern Connecticut has a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I, that's always what I think of when you talk about or when you hey, talk but, about that kind of stuff. It's like Calabasas I, and and like just yeah. Gren Greenwich in, in Connecticut. I feel know? like Naperville, Illinois, will be conquered in two <laughs> seconds. You got gangs from Chicago in a bit. There's a lot of money, a lot of people, and they do not own guns. Yeah. Yeah. And then, very quickly, if things were to fall apart, yeah. So, I wanted to ask your opinion on on the Ukraine war. I, it's my opinion that there was never really. A possibility without NATO interference uh, that that Ukraine would retain the uh, the borders that it had before Russia invaded. I think the people that are talking about going, you know, getting Crimea back and stuff are 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 clowns. And I think that the idea that without the United States that Ukraine could stop uh, 
Russia from taking the whole country. I think that's not that's a joke as well. I feel like the best option that we have is to convince Ukraine to uh, to to not surrender, but to to negotiate with Russia and convince Russia to negotiate as well. But I also think that there's so much money laundering going on over there that there's not an incentive for 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 the feds to actually put that kind of pressure on the 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 active players. And I would like your thoughts on the situation. A lot of points there. So let me try. Yes, I'm sorry. I apologize. Sorry. (laughs) Um, First, trying to out conventional war, the Russian army is a bad idea, uh, especially when you just don't have the manpower that they do. Um, Second, if the Ukrainians had been given and they were a, if they'd been given and they were able to fully function with all the equipment early on, there's a chance they could have broken through and done some kind of maneuver warfare campaign. But the pause, right? Because there's this, 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 much, this, the much, vaunted, that, this much vaunted offensive, which was supposed to happen this last summer, which didn't go anywhere. Why? Because the Russians know exactly the axis of approach that they're going to come. The Russians build the same kind of defenses that they would have done just north um, in the Battle of Kursk the summer of 43 was the biggest tank battle in military history. Wow. 6,000 tanks. Wow. God, wow. imagine that. <clears throat> okay, that was Nazi army versus the Soviet army. And there was, a, there was a, um, a bulge in the line of the Soviets. And the Germans were trying to break through from the north and south around the city of Kursk. But because the, the Allies had broken the Enigma Code, they knew what the Germans were planning. Down to unit position everything else and the russians found out and they built three and five layers of defenses which just ate all the the german attacks and it was the last offensive action the germans took on the eastern front that's exactly what the russian army did to the ukrainians this last summer they knew where they're coming and wherever they attacked they just ate it between um i mean doing high-end maneuver warfare is really hard the Russians do electronic warfare quite effectively, and if they did have a breakthrough, they're able to sow minefields via rockets, artillery, and even from aircraft, from helicopters. So, demographically, Ukraine needs to make a deal because at this point, all they're doing is chewing up their next generation of manpower, of manhood. They're, I heard they're, it's really, really awesome that you're confirming my biases, but what were you saying, Phil? <laughs> their, army is, their army is an average age of 43, if I understand correctly now. And that means that they have, they have gone they through have an killed entire... Up. Yes, they've killed a whole lot of you know, men. Because they've, they've literally sucked all the alpha males out of society and chewed them up in a, in a mm-hmm. Russian artillery grinder. Wow. It's I, crazy. I mean, uh, yes, they need a deal. At this point... What, what what was the purpose of us of the United States' involvement in the first place if this is the route it was going to go? I mean, did 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 the did Ukraine ever even stand a chance? And why why was the U.S. even bothering to get involved? I think there's a there's a there's a U.S. bias that our equipment is so spectacular that it will defeat any and all. And I think what um, our 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 kamikaze drones, the loitering munitions, all this techno wizardry stuff, which was designed to work against ISIS. Not worked. Not designed to work against a nation state with massive levels of electronic warfare. Meaning, jammers, um, localization, so that if you so much as emit, uh, turn a radio on and transmit in unfriendly territory, you're DF'd, direction found, and getting smashed with artillery rounds within minutes. Let me tell you, just from you can download an app on your phone that points to the direction of your cell tower, like yeah. if. Imagine what they can do. You turn your phone on, you turn a radio on, and they have a map showing exactly where you are. I know what they can do. Oh, right. (laughs) Of course, of course. I'm I'm, I'm not here to tell you. But it certainly seems like they lied to us in the press about what was going on. And I'm wondering, when you're watching all of this begin, are you sitting there shaking your head being like, oh, no. Well, first of all, again, trying to out-conventional war the, the Russian army... The, the the main player of the the entire Soviet army. Look, they say what you want. It's it's still the Soviet Union that defeated the Nazis. The U.S. played a, a role, yes, but it was our industry that played the biggest role, not the manpower. Think about um, uh, the Battle of Stalingrad. The Russians lost 1.2 million 
at the Battle of Stalingrad. The yeah. United States lost 250,000 in total in the entire European African theater. Wow. That's it. So and when they when they when they when they lost 1.2, they killed 800,000 Germans. And lost 1.2 million? Mm-hmm. Yes. This is, uh, I believe, more commonly known today as the Zap Brannigan strategy. <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah. Futurama. So in the, the show Futurama, okay. there is a doofus military leader named Zap Brannigan who says he defeated the killbots by sending wave after wave of his own men until the killbot count limit was maxed and they shut down automatically. <laughs> so, but the idea that the Russians were just like, that I is. mean, famously, they said they One built more into the breach. It yeah. was crappy tanks. It was crappy guns, but a lot of them. And they just said, flood the zone. Yep. People of plenty. Is that what you said? People of plenty. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I'm particularly fond of uh, Soviets or communists, obviously, but uh, the Russian, the Russians just throwing people at the Nazis. Like, it's not like they had, not like they could go anywhere. Like, the, they invaded yeah. their country. So, like, the, Soviet, the Soviets executed more soldiers trying to desert than we lost in combat. Oh, geez. In the wow. <clears throat> That's Jesus. <laughs> wave after wave, of, wave of, uh, after wave of your own men just straight into the frame. So you That's not to say, it. look, the U.S. provided, and I don't take away from any vet that fought in World War II. They went through hell in the Western Front as well. But it was American industry that made it possible for Zhukov to go from Moscow all the way to Berlin. Because you think about that, even back then, the German army was almost 50% still in horses using horses dragging wagons for support in the battlefield not vehicles the u.s was the first all mechanized all mechanized wow. horse man this is crazy we should have mechanized our way to moscow right after the world war ii but <laughs> could the u.s have taken down the soviets following world war ii i think there's a reason we didn't it would have been a hell of a fight right that's certainly what Patton wanted to do really he, he rightly yeah. saw bolshevism as a as a even greater threat and I think he was correct. And I think especially what we're seeing nowadays. Is, it, so this is interesting, too, because, you know, growing up with more uh, liberal friends, punk rock, anarchists. Oh, they say the, the Korean War, Vietnam, these were all big mistakes. And I think it's easy to say in hindsight, you know, like growing up being like, oh, here are the failures. It was a mistake. But I'm wondering now looking at, you know, it, it, it was a very different picture back then that, that I wasn't al- alive for. I'm wondering if. The fears that people have today over communism and the Marxist sentiments that are emerging in, in, the, in the United States among the left and universities, I'm wondering if, is that, is that what the military leaders saw with the Soviet expansion? This, this communist force was going to dominate global resources and then become this international dictatorship? Or was it just stupid people for stupid reasons, maybe for money or profit? I think Patton saw the Bolsheviks for what they were. Um and he saw it as a threat. The Bradleys, the Eisenhowers, they didn't as much. But uh, yeah, I think we just we just passed the anniversary of uh, Patton's death from a car accident. After you know, he was it's one of my favorite American generals because um, he was a uh, very decisive, took risks, and and made a lot of things happen. Yeah, I just wonder. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm just wondering: was there a legitimate fear of the spread of spread of communism that you know the, the the view that uh, I, I I'm I'm told when I'm growing up is military contractors the, the military industrial complex they want to make money they want to uh, maximize profits and revenue and they see war as a mean a means of driving that vehicle so whenever there's an opportunity okay we got to invade be it like the Gulf of Tonkin for a false flag the general view I have that I'm told about from activists and left is. There's no legitimate military reason to oppose the communist forces rising in other parts of the world. Is there is there actually an argument for this, or was it just foolishness? Ho Chi Minh, what screwed us up in Vietnam was the French, because Ho Chi Minh, as a young man, actually had a statue of had a Statue of Liberty model in his backyard when he lived in France, and it was because France wanted to be able to retain Vietnam as a colony that they got into it with the then Viet Minh. Uh, you've heard of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu when the, the French were surrounded and they mm-hmm. they had to surrender. And that really led to the French collapse. Now that caused a partition of kind of the communist area in the north and some kind of a southern free Vietnam. But um, 
when um, when the U.S. got dragged in to backing up a very corrupt South Vietnamese government. Yeah, we didn't want the whole place to to fall and and let all of Indochina become communist. But um, you know, America, whether it's supporting Diem or supporting um, Karzai or Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan, we have a bad habit of picking really idiot leaders to back. <laughs> That's how I kind of feel. So I'm 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 fairly, uh, I would say overwhelmingly actually uh, anti intervention, and I think it's 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 very simple. I, throughout my life, all I've seen is the U.S. screw everything up. It's just not worked out i wonder how much of that is the media though right uh, so when it comes to uh, what you know what's your what's your general view on afghanistan iraq uh the fall of afghanistan uh, after our withdrawal well i would say what should have happened after 9 11 is what happened in the first six months was i would say more like a roman punitive raid right in the roman empire when the, something on the empire did something bad They'd send the they'd send the hammer, and bring it down. And and that's you know, the Taliban, Al Qaeda were truly running for their lives for the first six months after nine eleven. That worked. A few hundred Saf backed by air power smashed the hell out of the Taliban. It's when the conventional forces arrived, big military industrial complex, and it's not just it's not just the industry. It's all the generals in the Pentagon because we have way too many of them. All want to get there to the war zone to get their promotion stars. When we allowed that, we basically went sideways for the next 19 and a half years. And for whatever improvements in society that were made, and there were a lot, it was all flushed. And we were defeated by, you know, (laughs) illiterate goat herders that were (laughs) using weapons that had been designed 70 years before. What an embarrassment. That is not how a superpower conducts itself. I tried to give Trump a an off ramp to let the, the the Afghan government stay in place, let the US forces leave. It would have cost less than five percent of what the US spend was. And yes, it did involve using contractors, but it's the same way that the East India Company used ca- built capacity in India and it worked for two hundred years. And they were mostly paid for themselves. And it used contractors attached to each Afghan battalion, living with, training with, fighting with a little bit of air support and to control their logistics supply, it would have kept the Afghan forces intact. It would have kept the Taliban at bay. And as a society, they could have functioned and it would not be, trust me, we've not heard the last of Afghanistan no. as much as we want to ignore it. There's a lot of shithead showing up there and a lot of other <laughs> badness fomenting. How, how did this go down? Donald Trump uh, uh, negotiates with the Taliban. He sets a timeline for the withdrawal of, of U.S. forces. Joe so, Biden comes in. Uh, well, yes. I, I mean, I had given I, Steve Bannon asked me to write an op-ed in the spring of 2017. Writers are about to have this policy discussion, laying out a different path. Trump reads the editorial, circles it at, at the Oval Office desk, calls in the National Security Advisor saying, I don't like your plan. I like this one. Do this. Now, that National Security Advisor was a three-star general, an armor officer from the Pentagon who wanted his fourth star and is not going to do anything counter to what the Pentagon wants. That was a problem for Trump. He never really controlled his security apparatus. Yeah. So they, they went with a bad plan. They went with the they went with the same plan they'd been doing for twenty years. Is that so? It, why did so people want to say ah, Eric Prince wants to privatize it? No, there was already thirty thousand contractors in country. I was going to take the number down to six. That's it. Six. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six thousand. Oh, six thousand. See that? Sorry. That. Sorry. No, no, I know, I know, but I want to just make sure I'm very clear. Why was it? Why was it delayed? Why? Why did? Why was the timeline set for for? the next presidential term creating this risk that you know joe biden could come in and burn everything to the ground was it was it trump playing politics that, saying that, no that, that's it's usually the pentagon saying well we can't pull back that fast it won't be we can't get our stuff you know, there's always i think that was uh can we wait this out and hope someone else gets in so we can keep our plan going on yeah but also like if, if it's from the the brass of the pentagon then they're thinking you know hey how can i you know you How can I help stars. this mas- massage my career because I want to be able to make general or get another star or, or what you know get a whatever kind of promotion or whatever so which is gross but how did how did this get screwed up so bad I mean even even with the plan of what we've been doing for twenty years how did it go so bad because no one was ever fully in charge you say you have an ambassador there but the ambassador is not in charge of the military forces at least the British had it right but look the United States is a lousy colonial power. <laughs> 
And and at least the British had it right that they put one person in charge that was in charge of all things diplomatic and military. So one person was responsible and one person was making the decision. We never had that in Afghanistan or Iraq for that matter. And so, you know, for example, the at the Afghan energy infrastructure was never done. There's oil fields that were drilled and proven by the Soviets in northern Afghanistan, up in Balkh province. My friend was a local partner. I saw the drilling reports. They were cemented when the Soviets left and nobody ever drilled them again. So a third of the U.S. budget. So the U.S. was spending like 60 billion a year. 60 billion. 20 billion of that was in fuel. And they had to move the fuel all the way from the Med, down across the Red Sea, up to Karachi, trucked up into Afghanistan. And so that the Taliban is tolling that fuel because you have to pay yeah. it, have to pay these guys. <laughs> so instead of drilling oil that was inside Afghanistan and producing it, taking care of it all and empowering the entire country, instead it was trucked across Afghanistan. And no general ever called bullshit on this to say, stop, this ends right now, drill it, refine it right here. And no, no adult made that decision. And that's so frustrating to me. I, I definitely we got a, we got so much to talk about. You know, with uh, uh, you mentioning the the Houthis shutting down the uh, uh, the the shipping, the Red Sea, the yep. Red Sea. I mean, that's crazy. All these different uh, uh, shipping companies saying we're we're suspending transport through the uh, through the Red Sea, Red Sea, right? Yes, crazy. But I have to make this point. Hearing this stuff, the conclusion that always brings me back to thinking domestically is nobody's in charge. I mean, th this this thing is, seems to be falling apart. Uh, maybe maybe it's it, that, that comes from Congress never holding anybody responsible, and they just keep throwing money at it. But not just international. I mean, uh, domestically, confidence is shattered. You've got the the political conflict. You've got the street level conflict. You've got what appears to be a military apparatus that acts as though a it's it's a chicken with its head cut off. So the only thing I see is just everyone's kind of sort of looking around at each other, shrugging. And trying to get as much money out of the system as possible before it all goes belly up. Maybe I'm too pessimistic. Spontaneous order rarely occurs in nature. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to put it. Man, you know, I view it. It's really hard to build a machine and it's really easy to break it. That's mm -hmm. right. Some dude can spend 20 hours building a house of cards and you can flick a pebble and the whole thing comes crashing down. That's what it feels like. That, that's what I feel like we're watching, especially going into 2024 with all this stuff. You've, you've got no one, you, you know, we, 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 bless her heart. We had Marianne Williamson on the show last night. She's a very nice woman. She's very lovely. She's, she's a liberal. And in that, her, her core principles, we very much agree with. But uh, with all due respect, I believe that she is very misinformed or, or uninformed on some of the top issues. You know, she wants to talk policy. She wanted to talk about, you know, what do we do with abortion? What do we do with this? And we talk about topical news on Tim Cast IRL. In her view, it's like these aren't things that the political debates are about when you're running for office. And I'm like, this is the headline news story for, say, like the New York Times, or this is culturally what people are, are wired into. And there are too many people in this country. The, the reason I use it as an example, again, not to be disrespectful, we, we think she's very lovely. There are too many people in this country who are just absolutely not paying attention. And it seems like there is no there there there's nobody driving this this ship and we're going to we're going to crash. You know, yeah. it's probably time for people to tune out of uh, Sunday afternoon and Monday night football and pay attention to what's happening in their crumbling country. The the point that we were talking or I think we both discussed earlier or both of you mentioned earlier was talking about like uh, your local fire departments and, and people focusing on their local areas and and being involved in their communities. I I don't know how to inspire people, especially when you when you've got urban areas where <laughs> people are stacked on top of each other. I I understand that it becomes less personal the more people you have around as the the anonymity of crowds that that or the anonymity that crowds allow you. But when it comes to um more suburban and rural areas, what do you think what do you think would inspire people to take more ownership of their own community and because that's really how you get people to to have the most positive effect in their on their own lives and also the people around like the the, the community that you live in should be where your focus is the, the president doesn't matter a whole lot when it comes to your day-to-day -day life yeah you know and i think that and that's right the problem in america is that the federal government has gotten way too big 100 percent 
we need this. This all can get fixed within the Constitution by emphasizing the Tenth Amendment. Yes. Everything not specifically delegated to the federal government remains the sole purview of the states. And I think COVID and the nonsense around that was a great reminder, a great wake up call that local governments matter. Your mayor, your county commissioner, Mm -hmm. your school board, that matters. And so, yeah, you start to see some of that wake up and people paid more attention to that local community, but always the centers of community have always been houses of worship and schools and uh, people being more involved there and, and, and doing charity through that um, is super important. That's what ties communities together. But the more that communities and then states can flex up and say no to Washington, even to the to, even saying to Washington, fuck off. We're, we're not doing this, this, and this because this is not in your mandate and on these things we will, we will push back hard. That has to happen. I feel like people don't even know who their neighbors are anymore. You know, churches used to be where people would gather and they would see their neighbors and they would talk. But we live in this digitized social order now. People don't talk to their neighbor. They're not coordinated. They're not organized. They never meet. And now everyone lives online. I think this is a huge component in why it seems like everything is falling apart. Because people are finding community and culture with people they don't live anywhere near. And then in the immediate and where they live, you look at the big cities, you look homelessness, feces in the streets, drug abuse. But instead of being focused on the things outside your door, people are on the internet focused on things unrelated to the to the streets right in front of their houses. On which pop star is dating, which football player, oh, especially. on which team is winning, meaningless stuff. To be fair, you know, when I heard that Taylor Swift was being transported in a janitor's cart, that was big news. So you hear this one? Basically, they have a popcorn machine, supposedly, and they're carting it through the arena. I'm kidding, but that was a, a big story. People are like, is Taylor Swift secretly being transported through a janitor's Look, mop man, cart? Man, I'm, I'm a songwriter. <laughs> Don't make me defend Taylor Swift, all right? <laughs> oh, I'm not ragging on Taylor Swift. I'm saying this is like the news that people care yeah. about is yeah. someone else deal with the, the hardship and the problems. I don't want to think about the homelessness. I don't want to think about the crime. But then you actually have, for tribal reasons, you've got people on the internet, prominent left-wing commentators arguing it's not really happening. The crime isn't happening. They're lying about it. The, immig- the mass migration crisis is not happening. It's, just, it's, it's almost like not only are there people who don't care about what's happening outside their doors, there are people who care about maintaining lies from other, with other people on the internet which actually sub- substantially makes the pro- makes the problem worse. That that brings up a question that I want to ask. Do you see behind closed doors with the people that you you know in in uh, in in the government and and contracting and stuff? Do you see any I have very little interaction with the government anymore? Oh, okay, all right. Well, <laughs> your old context because you have to see. I mean, I'm sure you're aware of the the you know the way that the the Pentagon has been jumping into social uh social issues and and things like the a lot a lot of a lot of really crazy things and i'm wondering if you see if you see that if you if you do see that kind of like the the social craziness seeping into the military and if you know of anyone in the military that has said anything about yo no people actually do know this is crazy and there's actually things being done about it because i really feel like the military no longer has lo- had lost its focus on what its job was the senior pentagon leadership really does believe in the kind of a, you know insanity that you're talking about like true believers they are they are woke officers following orders see cuz i understand <laughs> i understand and i can wrap and my head around it, it <laughs> that look the left has been out to in to spread their paradigm to every institution and the military wasn't that way and so they have been on it hard since the 90s to push that and now um and now you're seeing that and 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 especially even the stresses brought by um the iran uh, iraq and afghanistan wars even changed their promotions because it used to be that the army would promote um three out of four captains to majors now they produce after that they basically pr- promote 95 percent 
So whereas you were getting rid of the the bottom quartile turd, mm-hmm. that turd is now promoted and has made, made his way up the ranks. So that's in in the push on diversity, equity, inclusion, ES, all of that is is wrecking their recruiting numbers. I, I just I'm I'm imagining you know you're a private military contractor. You get a call say we've got this serious crisis. There's looters. There's murder. There's shooting. We need the best of the best to come and help secure this. And then you go. So we need to borrow your HR department. <laughs> well, no, no. But then I'm imagining a woke PMC being like, we could get the best guys, but there's too many white ones. So right. let's go ask these guys over here. And then you just get wiped out by bandits. These guys, you know, I, 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 I that one seems obvious. Meritocracy matters. But a lot of people don't care at the lower level of, of the like, you know, national security uh, people they don't underestimate the importance of security but you know like if they're going to hire a journalist they'll be like ah who cares well how do you determine who's who's meritocratic in journalism so they'll go for the diversity hires but if you're talking about life and death and warfare and <laughs> recruiting is becoming a, a, a component of recruiting is now are you the right race or identity what's going to happen when our very diverse 90 pound soaking wet you know, uh, a- otherly abled individuals meet the Russian forces on the front line. In the Roman Republic, it used to be like when the Battle of Cannae happened, which was a horrible loss to the Roman Empire. They lost like 40,000 guys in a morning. Like two weeks later, when the Roman Senate met, there was like 40% missing. Why? Because those elites had been in, in the battle in the field wow. with the army, the the leaders and their children. How many elites sitting in Washington today have sons or daughters serving in any capacity? No. It, it, so that's a, we have a complete divorce of elites making the decisions versus people living with those consequences. And so, yeah. you know, <laughs> but, but what did Rome do when they had that kind of loss at the Battle of Cannae? They sent Scipio Africanus who wiped out, he said, Carthagio Delende Est, Carthage must be destroyed. You want to see you know, what a proper ruler would do to the Houthis gathering in the streets, having shut off the, the, the straits, saying, and what's their saying? Death to America, death to Israel, victory over Islam. Smash their victory parade. Smash it properly. Teach them a lesson. Go Roman on them different discussion the next day so what 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 would what what would what would your answer to this be i mean it's it's crazy i saw the news uh a bunch of different shipping companies are saying we're done we're 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 not transporting anymore and this means they can't because the insurance companies get scared they can't and and, and so the ridiculous thing is right so the u.s the u.s position now is trying to put this coalition together and all these allies have supposedly joined and they're not really joining why because they're just going to escort ships through the straits (laughs) And they're going to shoot down. So the Houthis will shoot drones made by Iran that cost between twenty and fifty thousand dollars, and the U.S. will shoot them down with a two to two and a half million dollar yep. missile. Bad math, even in obese Washington. Um, what needs to happen? There was a similar problem in the '60s, actually. When and I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a like a an advertisement for PMCs, but it worked before. When Egypt invaded Yemen. The Saudis ended up hiring David Sterling, the founder of the SAS, armed by the Israelis, paid by the paid by the Saudis, and they went to work and they cleaned the Egyptians out. That's some some combination of that because I don't see any U.S. force ever going in there uh, and schooling the Houthis because they've been they have been trained and armed well by the Iranians and they will be a problem. But look, fifty two percent of global container traffic being shut off. Yeah. Everyone will feel that and soon because all your prices are going to be higher. Well, yeah, everything's going to be that much but, longer to get to market. But this people is will die, though. I, like, there's one thing that I want to I want to at least articulate that people need to hear. Like, it's not just that people are going to feel it; that will mean deaths. Yeah, there but will be a number of people that will delays exactly right. delays. And yeah. so, then and then everyone will blame Biden and Trump will get reelected. <laughs> so they, you know that's the end result of all of it. I, I was more thinking about the people that are going to that are going to say, oh, "Oh, it's bad to use military action to to prevent the Houthis from from stopping trade." It, if you 
mess with global trade. It's not people. Oh, so people don't quick, get it, man. You no, know, people. People so quickly go and say, "Well, you know, oh, it's the capitalists," and they start blaming. Uh, they start blaming capitalism and saying that it's rich people that are being hurt. Blah blah blah. But really, what happens is people. The glo- The fact that we have the trade routes that we do and international trade that we do means that poor people can get the things they need to survive. Economics translates into lives saved, and there are too many people that hate capitalism that love to go ahead and start start attacking capitalism because of these kind of things and for 80 so. years you basically had a pax americana in freedom of navigation around the world that is quickly being eroded by some jihadis and man jammies it's crazy you mentioned the the, the drones uh that are made by iran are 20 to fifty thousand dollars. he said yes i mean that sounds kind of crazy to me because i feel like a a consumer grade drone can be weaponized to an extreme degree for substantially cheaper. I mean, an IED on a on a commercial drone is right. much 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 cheaper and unstoppable. Well, it's stoppable. It's just a matter of the U.S. is is got their two million dollar solution and they need to have ten thousand dollar solutions. Look, there, right? There's two things a military commander does. What they coordinate information, meaning. They receive information and they pass information. And two, they release energy. You move the ship from here to there, march that formation from over there, or fire that weapon. The problem in America is our cost of energy of those weapons has gotten crazy expensive. That's been exposed very clearly in the in Ukraine war. All these weapon systems might be spectacular on the drill field, but way too expensive and not very reliable. And, and now... Very clear in the, in the Straits of the Babel Mandab as well. I think what uh, too many Americans don't understand, and 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 really, it's mostly liberals. You know, I'm sorry. Like conservatives tend to be uh, uh, have a, a higher understanding on average of survival requirements. I'm not saying every single conservative. I'm not saying every single liberal. But I think when you when you're a more rural you know individual, you understand a bit better. Being closer to the land bases you closer in reality. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't think these people who have been supporting uh, the, the funding and the war in Ukraine know anything about supply chain, economics, fuel costs, energy costs, uh, energy return on energy invested. I don't think they understand any of these things. I don't think they understand food requirements. You know, when uh, uh, Joe Biden famously said, you know, what was he talking about, like a civil war or whatever, and said, you're going to need an F-16 and nukes to go up against the, the United States. And I'm like, tell that to the Taliban, to the Viet right. Cong. Yeah. I mean, come on. But on, at, at the same time, when uh, when you see these memes talking about, and I don't, I don't mean to bring it back to, to, to domestic stuff and civil war, but I just mean military conflict in general, Ukraine, for instance, food. If if men are not eating, they are not fighting. And your, your multi-million dollar rocket systems may as well be a brick sitting That's in the right. middle of the field. Novices argue tactics, professionals plan logistics. Yeah. So you talking about Magic the Gathering. I, I used to play too. And one of the, <laughs> so they, you know, they made novels that go along with the stories in like the Urza saga stuff. Like all the novels were about building the artifacts. It was all about logistics, all about mining and blah, blah, blah. Because they, you know, they want to tie in the land and the, yeah. and the artifacts and stuff. And it it's, it makes it's, it fun. It's something that people don't think about the everyone thinks about the guys that are on the ground that are getting into the gunfights that's what the military is when they think about it and really what what the military kind of modern military is is bringing modernity with you just like you'd said earlier is like the fa- the 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 concept of just drill where you are get the oil that's there out refine it there and make the fuel that you need like that's something that your average person would never think about like they don't think about that that kind of logistics no. or those, those that type of infrastructure being built on the fly i you know it's funny when we talk about say the civil war gettysburg i've got a union civil war rifled musket right over there that i got from an antique store and i was watching a documentary on the battles of gettysburg when i was in gettysburg it's only like 40 minutes away and it was uh, really fascinating to hear about the Confederates' use of breech-loading rifled muskets versus the Union at the time. Begun, they, they had begun using. Uh, uh, they, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Confederates Go from were using muzzle loading to breech loading. Yeah. Mu- the Confederates were using muzzle loaders, yep. and the Union started using breech loaders, which rapidly increased their speed. And we're also fascinated by wow, the Confederates never saw it coming. The Union soldiers had these paper cartridges they could breech load, and 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 very very quickly relative to the muzzle loading. And then no one ever talks about 
How did any of these guys eat food? Because that's substantially more important when you've got how many, how many, how many soldiers? There's like a hundred thousand or something. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of people to feed with where's the food coming from who's making it how are they getting it to those lines 200 years ago when you didn't right, have refrigeration right. and why railways were so important you're bringing a farm I, with you you know it's it's fascinating uh that people grossly underestimate the most powerful weapons in war they assume it's it's weapons and bombs and uh, i i love giving I've, I've been watching this uh, uh dr stone it's an anime manga but there's a really great line in it where it's it, the story is simple restarting civilization from scratch oversimplified and there's a conflict between two tribes but they have modern one guy has modern scientific understanding because it's a post-apocalyptic kind of scenario he says we're going to build the most powerful weapon mankind has, has has ever created and the other guy goes don't tell me you're going to make nuclear weapons and he goes no radio <laughs> he says cell phone I, I think it's silly but he builds a radio and he's like once we have the ability to communicate at the speed of light we will outflank and defeat our enemy and engage in information warfare and control them outright. And people don't realize these things. They assume it's like, yeah, well, he's got an F-16 and nuclear weapons. You can't win. Yeah, China is, is sending TikTok over here to turn your children into a bunch of morons. You will not have a fighting force. Doing a good 20s. job of that. Absolutely. So that, that's, that, that people don't understand what, what, what fighting and what war is about. Well, let me, let me throw it to you in this way. How would you define war? Like, what, is, what does war mean? A lot of people want to define war as only when, when the actual shooting starts. The reality is, it is a spectrum of conflict that goes from disagreement on an issue to all the steps, all the, the continuum of leverage that someone can apply, whether it's soft power, sanctions, economic leverage, etc., um, that a, an opponent can apply, call it a, a pressure point even to get you to submit before there's even a punch thrown in a boxing ring. Uh, so we are very much in a war between a, I would say two things. One against, uh, the CCP, the Chinese communist party. And I would also say we're in a war Judeo Christian Western civilization is, uh, against, an Islamic Sharia supremacist mentality, the likes of Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, etc. But I mean, the CCP, I suppose, the Judeo-Christian values. It, it's a, it's an ideological war between these factions. It's 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 more than just territory. It's more than just. And and, and I say Judeo-Christian. I mean uh -huh. a a republic government with a, it, Magna Carta, U.S. Constitution that kind of society where the, the man's role in the state is defined that an individual has rights um, and the government has limited a power to affect that person. Enlightenment right? philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That philosophy is very much in conflict with the Chinese Communist Party, which wants to rule everything and make it and, re, and reimagine, not remake the societies in their image. Are we winning or losing? Mm, we are, I would say it's been a scrum and we are slowly, uh, we're losing, we are losing yardage right now, but, um, but leadership can turn that around quickly. And I, I think back to, you think about the seventies, lose the Vietnam war, helicopters off the roof of the U S embassy in Saigon, 75, Iran hostage crisis, um, uh, oil embargoes. The President of the United States is on television, Jimmy Carter saying, wear a sweater, it's not going to get any better, turn your thermostat down. The malaise, all just the, it was bad. Did he make, did he say that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Just a little, just a, just a hair before my time. He was, he years. was, uh, he literally wore a, like a cardigan sweater and said, you know, turn your thermostat down, save electricity. That's why they, that's when they mandated 55 miles an hour as well. Yeah. Oh, was, was it? That was forcing, okay. forcing fuel savings. I don't think that's correct, by the way. What's that? That 50, it used to be, I believe, 50 miles, 55 miles an hour was the most efficient speed to maintain based on like gear ratio or whatever, but I don't think that's true today. Oh. It could be. Probably not. No, but, but, but again, there's a bias because insurance companies lobby for it. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seatbelt laws. But Reagan came along and said, enough containment. 
We're going to fuck the commies. He said, we're going to go at them economically, politically, culturally, socially, everywhere we push back. He unharnessed, unshackled the U.S. economy, cut taxes, cut regulation, and went after the Soviets, and the Soviet Union collapsed. So leadership matters, and fortunately, we don't have much right now. Do you think Trump would do a good job? I think he is, um, I think he will. I think uh, he certainly has to has to have learned lessons from the people that have failed him in the past yeah. and, um, and to make better choices. And he knows, look, I think the real constitutional crisis is that we're supposed to have three branches of government in America. The reality is we have four. We're supposed to have an executive and a legislative and judicial, but we have a permanent unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy yes. that get, that does whatever the hell they want and they must be brought to heel. And, well, and it, it, even if that's going I, back to I, an I, Andrew removed, Jackson- fired. Even if it means going back to an Andrew Jackson style spoil system. Because effectively- Can you lay that out for people so that who aren't familiar? <clears throat> Early on, before the civil service, it was, it was the, the, the paradigm that civil service were above politics and would never tilt towards one party or the other. That's kind of the the rules that made it so that civil service can't be fired. Andrew Jackson before that said, well, if a government's elected, they should be responsible for everybody that's in the government and should be able to hire and fire anybody from, from bottom to top. Mm -hmm. Probably some hybrid of that. Yeah. But there's, I mean, look, what Mile is doing in Argentina is so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, any man that takes a chainsaw to a political rally, I can identify with. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so as, look, a symbol, as a symbol, there was no chain on it. <laughs> no, true. <laughs> true. But, but yes. Uh, but message delivered. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the guy is literally, he, he just unshackled the Argentine, Argentine economy. In fact, he even went back to any, you can use any currency to settle a debt now. Wow. So I I mean afuera. <laughs> that that I think like Vivek needs to start saying that. It's a meme. For Everybody all the stuff gets he's it. Cut. Yeah. And and Millet's doing it. He is. It's amazing. I mean, his first day in office, immediately after inauguration, he zeroed out a whole bunch of agencies. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm a little surprised that he's he seems to be having the success that he's having because uh, you know and I'm, the I'm, longevity of life. Yeah, I'm yeah I'm a whole continent away, and I'm not super familiar with Argentines Argentina's uh, political situation and how the the things work on the ground. But it from an outside perspective, it, it is surprising to see someone make those kind of dramatic changes. And uh, you know, I hope that I hope that he that he continues, and I hope that he is extremely I've, successful. I've, I feel like. Uh, the CCP would not wouldn't stand a chance against a decentralized Judeo-Christian economic and and, and uh, a political system. The problem is everything's hyper centralized and and bogged down by deep state bureaucratic elements, which restrict us from doing anything. Correct. Look, the business of America should be business, not so much government. Yeah, and we have an incredibly talented, innovative private sector. Um, that does get thwarted and blocked and di- and redirected into so much politics. Look at how much money and cap, how much capital has been redirected by the ESG crowd. Yeah. To, to literally trying to remake the entire energy industry into doing green stuff with no economic basis, just off of feeling horrific. I, I, I think the pendulum is starting to swing back, but it needs to swing back harder and faster. What do you think about nuclear energy? I think it's fantastic. Agreed. I, th- you know, typically what we hear from these activists is lies about it, and I think this shows that the that one of the problems we have, particularly, <coughs> you know, again, to single out your default liberal, they don't want a solution. They want a problem that they can monetize, so that you will give them money, so the government will give them money, and then they can live in penthouses they, in big cities. Or they there, can get there's an entire. Power. Sadly, there's an entire NGO industry that has grown up around government as a second layer of lobbying. Right? You have lobbyists that are paid, and they declare, well, "I'm lobbying for this industry." But then you have NGOs, which basically serve as staffing agencies for political parties, um, to feed back into the Washington system and and advocate broader. And it's just it's just corruption. Hmm. Again, this all comes back to unlimited ability to print money 
Mm-hmm. Washington would be less stupid if it didn't have as much money to spend. And and so we have thirty three trillion in debt. We need to go on a diet. We need some hard economic realities and cuts. We need to do someone like Mile needs to do that to the U.S. bureaucracy. And we need a Congress. And that's the problem. Republicans hold Congress now, and they've still appropriated a lot of stupid shit. Yeah. Are we in? Are are they in charge or not? Greta Thunberg. You know, uh, you know she is right. She's yeah, the, afraid so. Oh yeah, she said a couple of years ago. She says we don't want to end fossil fuels in ten years, in five years. We must end it now. What would happen to the United States, and what would happen to the world if we shut off all oil production and use right now? Huh. I'll give you an example. The highest incidence of insurance claims that we had when all our guys were in Afghanistan was lung infections. Why? Because the Afghans were burning whatever they could to try to stay warm. Trash, trash, plastic, uh, manure, everything. Because they had a life without hydrocarbons. Yeah. That's what life would be like without hydrocarbons. We would be miserable freezing to death. In the dark. Uh, In the dark. Yep. No electricity. And you would be walking uphill to and from school. (laughs) (laughs) You would be. I think the estimates are if uh, all oil use ceased right now, like in a, in a moment, within a within a matter of days, it's like sixty million dead. Oh, and and probably longer than that when you get a good cold snap. Yeah, I, I mean, I imagine that sixty million is a little on the on, on the, the low side. side. Yeah, because just of all the people that rely on refrigerated. It's not just that. If food, right? Yes, it's food logistics. It's not just heat. Yeah, it's yeah. people, uh, elderly people in places like Florida without air conditioning will die. Yeah. Uh, elderly people in places that are cold without heat will die and more people die and i mean i assume that our our listeners know this but more people die of uh of cold than of heat every year yeah it, i mean it, exposure is a is yeah. a, uh, unforgiving yeah it's kind of crazy when, 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 i learned this uh, when i was young because uh you know i had a dad who was a marine and a firefighter and he explained exposure it, it's like it could be 60 degrees and you're in and they find dead bodies it's just someone who is, they didn't get a fire oh, going. Just laying down on the ground. Yep. Like, like the ground will suck the, the heat right out of your body. you will be Indeed. dead in three hours. There's the rule of threes, you know, three days or three minutes without air. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, water. maybe, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but there's got to be some kind of reset. I am not advocating for shutting down all energy or anything, but I'm saying people have become so fat and happy and complacent and ignorant to the requirements of human beings survive that there are people who, uh, you know, I love this meme where it's a man and a woman standing on, uh, uh, it's a cliff and there's a beautiful city and they're standing on it and they're hugging and below it is a bunch of soldiers holding it up. I don't think these people in cities, when they say things like abolish the police, they don't know what life is like without security. Like you mentioned, having to get an armed convoy to go to the store to pick up groceries or something. I mean, I don't know. Do you want to, do you want to explain what it's like living in a zero trust society or in a conflict? it's it's a it's a living hell because you literally have to worry every time your kids go in the yard or or to go anywhere to do anything it makes your it makes your world extremely small because you cannot you don't dare go anywhere you can't trade you can't even sell the skill sets that you have effectively uh because you can't get to where someone will pay you for it again high trust societies flourish Low trust societies collapse, and that's what's happening in many cases, many places around the world. It's we we are becoming lower and lower trust every day in this country. There's a, a viral video of a woman in Ireland, and she's shocked. She's like a Gen Z woman that in Ireland you pump your gas and then pay. It used <laughs> to be that way when I was a kid. Exactly, you'd go up, you'd pull, you'd fill a thing up, then you'd walk inside and pay. Now you got to prepay, and then you don't even know if you got the number right. Come back and get your change. <laughs> you can still pay after in Wyoming. Really? Still a high trust society. <laughs> Wyoming. That's Wyoming that. is too, what America was. It's too cold to run away from anyone in Wyoming. You well. Freeze to death yeah. before you get anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I drove through Wyoming. I thought I was going to run out of gas because it was hundreds of miles between gas stations. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of nothing. Big, big, big empty. A lot of good people. But a lot of so, good people. Absolutely. So do you have, uh, do you have any, any opinion on whether or not the U.S. should intervene in the Venezuela. So are you familiar with what Venezuela is doing? I, so what? what is your I take think on... I think we're already involved. <coughs> are we? Do, 
Um, I believe the whole the whole spat with Guyana. Yeah, because the Exxon, you know, Exxon Mobil finds oil, and then yes. and then Venezuela is so, like, oh, well, you know, just to Venezuela already sits on more hydrocarbons, more oil than anywhere else on the planet, even more than Saudi Arabia. Um, their little neighbor Guyana, a former British colony to the east, made a huge discovery with Exxon four years ago. And they've now brought it in production. Guyana is the fastest growing economy in the world. Really? Yes. And now Venezuela has gone well off the, the cliff of socialism. Um, they went through their Chavez revolution, pure, pure socialism. Now this clown Maduro is in charge. And it's very much a gang of, um, and interestingly, um, they're supposed to have an election next fall. Now, the Biden administration uh, relaxed sanctions against Guyana in exchange for them having this election. Maduro is doing his best to block anyone from running against him and getting him removed from the ballot. Wait, Maduro's on the ballot in Guyana? No, no. Oh. Sorry, in Venezuela. Okay, okay, okay. But the woman who's running against him, Maria Karina Machado, um, great libertarian candidate, he actively blocks everything she tries to do. If she goes to a hotel... The hotel is closed the next day by the tax authorities. If she goes to a restaurant, closed the next day by the regulatory authorities. So what Maduro is doing to Machada is very much similar to what Biden is doing to Trump nationwide. I was just going to say that like the, it's it sounds like a more extreme version of what the what the Democrat Democrat establishment would like to do to oh, yeah. political Absolutely. dissidents here. Yep. You know, for sure. There are, you know, I'm sure you've heard of the, the, uh, of media matters and, yep. and the lawsuit that's being brought against them because they really are just a, a, an, an entire organization dedicated to being political hit, you know, writing political hit pieces. For sure. And so go ahead. I'm sorry. So that's okay. So, uh, after this, well, this woman, Maria Karina wins the primary to run against Maduro. Um, the Venezuelans get spooked, the Maduro cloud, and they, and they roll out a 130 some year old property dispute claiming that all this, about 70% of Guyana actually belongs to Venezuela. Now turns they made out, that turns claim, out that's where all the oil and gas is. Yeah. <laughs> but they made that claim like before though, isn't this 1895. In, well, okay. Yeah. And then it was delineated in 1962 at independence, but conveniently yeah. roll it out right after they have a, a viable opposition candidate. The last time there was any kind of election in Venezuela was 2014. The guy that won, never able to take office, Maduro stayed in, in power. Really? Yeah, uh, uh, Chavez did. Yeah, it's just, that is a- Maduro. Maduro. It's the Maduro state. Yeah. Guyana's uh, uh, GDP growth last year, 19.9%. Uh, yeah, and it'll be wow. much bigger this year. Wow. And again, if they lose, it's called the es Esequibo- uh, everything west of the Essequibo River is what the um, the Venezuelans are claiming. Um, Venezuela's, or sorry, uh, Guyana is like 800,000 people. They don't have much of a military. I think they have two functioning helicopters left. I didn't know so they had a third, but they lost it uh, two weeks ago with a whole bunch of people on board. Oh, man. They need... They need capacity to defend themselves. They need a whole country. <laughs> like yeah. 800,000 people is nobody. Ah. That's a city. But but the jungle always gets a vote. And the area that the Venezuelans would have to occupy is very thick jungle. Mm. And so you... So you know... You, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I, I just... <coughs> you know, I'm just starting to realize socialists are bad people. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. I didn't just realize they that. They just... They want to take your stuff. What's mine is mine <laughs> and what's yours is mine, right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the problem with socialism, socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. Um, yeah. oh, that, is, that is a money. Well, and, and so, you know, so Venezuela has like a million barrels in production today because they used to be at two and a half, but because of the sanctions and other screw-ups, it's, it's fallen. So them taking um, a huge chunk of Guyana is, uh, is good math for them. It would, if they did that, it would bump up the Venezuelan economy by like 25%. But it would, it would be temporary because they, the, as soon as the, the government of Venezuela gets in charge of that area, the same thing that happened to Venezuela is going to happen to that area. Oh I mean, yeah. That, that 
there's no they, they, oil there's, will just stop. Yeah, I mean that's the that's part of the problem they're having now. Is it, I mean they have like like Eric said they they have plenty of resources for themselves. They can't get it out of the ground because the people that know how to get it out of the ground either got out of there or they killed or you know they stole the and they've the, nationalized a lot of it. Yeah, they stole the the yeah. infrastructure from Exxon Mobil who built it in the first place, and the people they have running it don't know how to get oil out of the ground. So that problem is only going to be uh, the same problem in the in the new pro new uh, yep. area well, they they occupy. So should the, I'm, I'm wondering, should the U.S. be involved in Guyana in some way? Or I'm wondering if just it's, it's Exxon's responsibility. They're a private corporation. They can defend their, their oil fields. Um, Guyana has money. They can spend money on buying defense capacity from wherever they need to defend their territory. It's not something you have to send U.S. troops to be involved yeah, in. That's the best answer. But there's plenty of capacity that they can buy or they can rent and they need to do something soon yeah i mean it's, it's it's kind of fascinating you've got you've got a lot of oil you've got a lot of resources that can be sold for high value if the venezuelans get their hand on, hands on it it becomes zero but for the time being if properly managed they guyana can defend it absolutely and it's a national becomes a national annuity i mean i think the the royalty payments were like a billion six last year and it's supposed to go up by twice that for this uh, for 24 i think uh, uh i think the u.s is involved already i think we're flying something over mm -hmm. there they did some joint military flights or something which means a u.s aircraft would fly over guyana <laughs> right. there's nothing, only eight hundred thousand of them nothing <laughs> significant How, what's yeah. the, do you know what the population of venezuela is is it uh, I, mean, I think it's about 24 25 million yeah caracas wow. has more people than the, than than the whole country oh, and and the and the population of the uh Esequibo is very small very thin because yeah. there's like no roads yeah it is deep six dudes deep, in loincloths that's it well, it's, uh, what do we have how do you uh actually find that specific Essequibo dispute they say it's going back to the 15th century <laughs> i don't know I, I i i i suppose yeah i just i don't want venezuela to move in it i have concerns about you know what we can talk about world war three you know what really frustrates me is when i say something like civil war people immediately think 1861 and they don't think bolshevik revolution they don't think weimar germany they don't think spain other or syria other civil wars have happened and they're very very different to what happened here in the united states and when we talk about world war three they assume it means the u.s versus russia or something and i'm like no 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 world war could be venezuela is in full-scale war uh, in South America, the invasion of Guyana triggers some kind of territorial dispute. Brazil is on the borders there as well. Tensions are escalating. Then you've got Middle East. You've got Iran. You've got the Red Sea conflict. Now you've got Eastern Europe. And then China invades Taiwan. There is hot conflict happening in every region of the globe. You have a world war. I'm wondering if, uh, uh, like, what, 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 is, what is the likelihood of either that version or a full-scale, like, hot conflict between U.S. and Western power or Eastern <clears throat> powers? I, you got to think about who the provocateurs are behind Venezuela doing this. Cuba had attached itself as a client state, like a tick, onto the Soviet Union, and they received huge aid from them until 91 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Then Cuba was kind of on its own, and they drifted, and they attached themselves to Venezuela, first with doctors, then with military intelligence advisors. But there is significant Cuban presence and muscle inside Venezuela. There's significant Russian and Iranian capacity there now as well. Yeah. Okay, so the Iranians have built a drone factory. There's a couple thousand Iranian- In Venezuela? Person. In Venezuela. Yes. And I'd imagine they would like these oil fields too. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Cuba could take it for themselves and then they're feeding uh, all of Cuba with, with Guyana and oil. Hezbollah, the Lebanese proxy force. Look, when the, when the Lebanese civil war happened in the 70s, you had a huge- amount of talented people a lot of lebanese christians and sunnis that fled all over the world and they settled in a lot of different small spots and they built really good trading networks and Leb uh, hezbollah as a terror organization has built on those trading networks especially for drugs and arms trafficking now all through um uh south america and getting very established in venezuela and look the reason Venezuela was called the city of gold or El Dorado is because there's a ton of gold 
and oil and resources in the country. It is a that is a place to be pillaged in their mind, and they're doing it now. So, what do you think the chances of the United States invoking the Monroe Doctrine and <coughs> and becoming well the, the interesting in the, inter- yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing about the vote, I think it was a double fuck you to America, is that Venezuela declared this vote on the 200th anniversary to the day of the Monroe Doctrine of the announcement. <laughs> and that probably, that, I imagine that was not an accident then. I, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. For anyone that uh, is listening and doesn't know the Monroe Doctrine is basically the United States saying any uh, countries from the Eastern Hemisphere uh, have no business meddling in the affairs in the Western Hemisphere and we will get, or the United States will get cranky about it. And by cranky, I mean drop bombs. But it doesn't seem like they do. I, I mean, this president, no, but I mean, I don't, I don't know what, you know, Trump would do sh- should there, should Trump win. Uh, Look, this, this, this speaks to the need for American foreign policy. And I agree with you. We have too many military interventions, way too many. But when you think about the, and we talked about what is, what is war? It's a continuum of conflict. Mm -hmm. And you think about the continuum of, of options you have to deal with that. You have diplomats and embassies, conferences. Okay. Uh, uh, Diplomats for that. And then you have on the other end, you have, aircraft carriers and tank divisions and and big weapons the middle the 80 percent of the middle is the intelligence community with um covert action that can be done to shape those outcomes so that the big big green machine never has to get involved when after 9 11 happened when the president went to the cap uh, went to camp david to say what the hell do we do the pentagon while its headquarters was still smoldering, said we want to do a mechanized invasion of Afghanistan from Pakistan with 45,000 man unit. But we're not going to do that until the following April. That's the best the Pentagon came with. It was the CIA that said, money, authorities, and in three weeks, the flies will be walking on the eyeballs of our enemies. That was Kofor Black, the head of the counterterrorism center, and that worked. They took less than 100 agency and special operations guys backed by air power and smashed the Taliban in the eighties. And so I, I can give you lots of examples of small, impotent uh, application of force that affects the battlefield in Nick, in the eighties, the Sandinistas, you had a communist government in Nicaragua actively cooperating with the Cubans and the Soviets, and they were pushing all kinds of weapons and problems into El Salvador so the agency modified one boat, basically a big scarab, put a put a one inch chain gun, a twenty five millimeter chain gun in the bow of it, and one little bird with rockets, smashed the ability of the of the enemy to resupply. No big DOD involvement at all. Small footprint works almost every time. This is the the what you're outlining here. It's reminiscent of the kind of uh kind of operation that shank was talking about wanting to see in gaza which is you know special forces kind of idea now i don't know that the application would or work. aoc said the same thing did she well, she, she was saying effectively surgical strikes <clears throat> on on hamas leadership well i mean that's what they're doing that's surgical strikes <clears throat> in an that, urban area look like what happens yeah. in gaza you know okay trying to do special operations forces into a city urban labyrinth which is what it is. And it's not just a 360, it's a 720 a threat because they have massive tunnel network underneath. Doesn't really work. You need only a conventional grinding approach. I did, um, I did recommend to the Israelis to try a drilling strategy of taking the best of Texas. And I said this with all love. Um, you know, well, I won't say that. Hit him with the Armageddon, get the drillers <laughs> no, out there no. to drill into the uh, ground. But I said, bomb. look, Texas understands drilling. And horizontal drilling technology has gone a long ways where it can go miles and miles and miles and hit a one meter target uh, for for exploration or for, for telecom or whatever. And there was some articles printed, but I think they, they are now flooding the tunnels yeah. with seawater. As uh, any building, we have a busted pipe. Water is a pretty unstoppable force. Yeah. 
We had a we had a leak the other day. It is it is a nightmare. You yep. still have it. We walked by it. Tonight. No, it's 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 the water. Well, yes, the water is shut off. But it's crazy how you get a leak. Everybody who own, owns a house knows this, and it's like holy crap! Turn the water off, and we've got panel damage, wood damage, and it happens so yep. so quickly. Get the fans on there, dry it out as fast as possible. Man, it is crazy. Now I couldn't imagine dumping flooding seawater and it's an unstoppable force uh, yes and and i would recommend bringing the same kind of stuff you use for flooding um um duck impoundments 36 inch flexible vinyl pipes that you can literally create rivers of flow and again p for plenty yeah. water seawater is cheap and available and it would it would flood all their weapons caches it makes them move the hostages and it denies them use of tunnels as a as an ability to maneuver. So I guess what's your what's your general overview of this coming year? You know, there's there's World War Three fear, there's civil war it's fear. Gonna, it's going to be a wild, wild. Year. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a, a lot of people well, think right. that there are going to be riots upon oh, the 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 actual announcement of whatever the announcement will be after the 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 fourth I, of I, November. But like, what about? I think that there's going to be problems leading up to it. Yes. I think it's up for, so that's, it's an interesting, so who are the people best able to stop that kind of nonsense and prevent riots from happening? Who is charged that responsibility? Fathers. Mayor, no, first, well, mayors. Okay, yeah. Chiefs of police. Um, those people must be prepared to make difficult decisions with imperfect information and to lock that shit down. If they, unless they want to see their societies look like Ghazni or, or or Gaza uh, and have it melted down by riots, they must maintain law and order. I I fear that that's actually a destabilizing force. I, I don't know that there's an, an alter, alter, alternate answer. And uh, I I don't think I could... Uh, uh, I, I, with, with what the far left has already done in Seattle, Portland, Minnesota, Atlanta... With the uh, and now Stop Cop City, it's not just uh, Stop Cop City. It was the Wendy's, the, these autonomous zones that they've created and defended with with rifles. Are you familiar with Top uh, Cop City stuff? Uh, the chop, the chop, the the thing no. in, they did in Washington. No, no Cop City is an actual. There's a, 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 a they're trying to build a training facility outside of uh, Atlanta. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's that. essentially and got, it's under siege. Yeah, they're shooting. They shot a cop. So, so they they set fire to houses. They f they set fire to construction equipment. They f they they torched a private truck from some, from random guy. And yep. speaking to your point about having the courage to do anything, so that comes down on Governor Kemp. Knock that shit off. Well, so they, I'm sure the Georgia State Patrol, if you gave them direction, would lock that down. So there was a hundred plus far left extremists who stormed into the government property through the fences. There was, I, I believe, they firebombed some construction equipment. And now 60 plus are being charged with state level, very serious charges. Federal government doesn't seem to care at all. But if we're coming into 2024 and you see, you know, Brian Kemp says security corridor, we're locking this down. We're going to defend. We're going to have police. The far leftists are going to use that. I'm not saying you don't do it. I'm just saying there, there's a component in which the far left then says, see, everything we told you was correct. And these as a recruiting tool. The, the fear I have with this is it's like, it's a tower that's wobbling left and right. And the more we try to stabilize it, the more it just grows and starts wobbling further and f faster and faster. Yeah, but I don't think you can, you, you can't let them go unchecked. I agree. They have, people have, <laughs> malfeasance must, meet, must be met with consequences. I, I, I think the challenge is th there, there's no, there is no central force in this country. There, there is no, there, there perhaps seven years ago, I'm having these conversations about the fear of civil war with the rising tensions. We saw people fighting in the streets. I'm at the Trump rallies in 2015 when, when they're beating elderly <laughs> people. And then we start seeing these articles pop up, people talking about it. I was told over and over again by these conservative influencers, uh, it's impossible for there to be a civil war in this country because the, the central state, the, sta the, the federal government powers, security apparatus would never allow tribal faction fights to escalate. The only problem now is the federal government is a component of the tribalism, the targeting of Trump supporters and the I, ignoring of the far left extremists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, and there's just general buffoonery across so many federal agencies. Yeah. There's just not serious people anywhere. Right. So if you look at January 6th, for instance, uh, we were talking to Marianne Williamson the other night, 
We, uh, uh, I ask about the January, the, the, the J sixers who are being criminally charged and Marion's response is generally, well, the jury's decided if this person should go to prison, they should. That's how the system works. And then I ask about the May 29th insurrection to which she says, what was that? When they firebombed the White House, forced the president into the emergency bunker, set fire, set fire to St. John's Church, 70 plus police officers are injured. She said, I don't know anything about it. How how can we have stability when you have far left extremists? I mean, I got I to gotta be completely honest. The threat of violence from the far left outweighs the right to such a psychotic and extreme degree. But that is not the perspective of your default liberal or even a presidential candidate, because the only thing they hear in the press is the far right is bad. January 6th was bad. It was a riot. We get that. But you had four. It was stupid, but it was not an insurrection because it would be the first insurrection in history to show up unarmed. Yeah, right. In a country with like 300 million personally owned firearms. The the ins- the idea of it being insurrection is just is for political usefulness. Right, yeah, yeah, sure. Right. But- among, on the far left, we've had four occupations, mm-hmm. and 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 those are large scale. What people don't even include in the occupations in in uh, in Portland, roving bands of armed far left extremists have been taking over uh, street corners, aiming rifles at trucks. There was a famous uh, 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 I shouldn't say famous, but there was a well known story where a truck driver got out and aimed his nine millimeter at a far left extremist who had a five five six, and I'm like, that's happening on the streets of this country. The media, it's not its not a pressing issue. That going into 2024, oh boy. If you've got far left extremists that are willing to firebomb police vehicles, the White House, uh, they firebombed federal building in Portland for 90 plus days and only a small handful of people ever get charged for this. Right. What do you think is going to happen if, you know, these cities say we're going to bring in security forces? It, the far left is going to ramp things up like we've never seen. So again, the people that are in positions of that people that have sworn an oath in positions of responsibility, those chiefs of police, state police, governors have to do their job. And it's not to say that every governor is going to be great because they're not. There's a lot of weaklings, but moral courage is contagious. And when a few governors do the right thing and lock it down, um, eventually they'll figure it out. I agree that moral courage is contagious. I don't think think that we have any morally or we have exceedingly few morally courageous people in government well i agree i i do think there needs to be a security uh, play in place but here's my fear I, I can't say at what probability this would be but what do we know right now about how the media operates in this country alongside the escalation of political tribal tensions if the far right farts it is headline new york times the end is nigh. If a far leftist murders someone in cold blood, nobody touches the story. David Dorn shot and killed during the Summer of Love riots. And they say the far right is dangerous. In fact, Kamala Harris solicits donations. Joe Biden's staff pays yep. donations to get these people out of jail. Kyle Rittenhouse, they whip that into a frenzy. Absolutely. Try them. Yeah. So my fear, we're entering 2024. We've got primaries, rallies. The When I was uh, covering the Trump presidency uh, uh, presidential campaign in 2015 2016 i watched roving bands of bernie sanders supporters and oh they they lied lied when i would say oh these were bernie guys that were mercilessly beating people in the streets and they're like, how did you know that oh well, the guy was wearing a bernie shirt what, what, what do you want me to say a 20 something year old man with a bernie shirt punched another guy in the face what else can you want me to say here my fear would be this uh, local police are instructed, guys, we're having a political, uh, it's, it's a primary night and Donald Trump is doing this thing or otherwise, uh, we need to be on high alert. Police go out. Far left extremist throws a brick at a cop's face. Fight breaks out. Far left extremist gets, you know, in the scuffle, beaten and arrested. The media then reports police mercilessly beat peace activists unprovoked. Something to this effect. The media will lie. They will cover it up. They will blame the cops when a far leftist does something psychotic or extreme. Yeah, the, th- the communication cycle has to be much faster where the body cam footage has to be released immediately so that the media doesn't get to lie. Because They'll lie anyway. I mean, look at George Floyd. The, the body camera footage didn't come out fast enough, and it should have because it changed a lot of the context. I still think there's issues there for sure. But 
During Occupy Wall Street, I'm live streaming. Or actually, this is a, a common occurrence with Occupy Wall Street. I'm out live streaming a protest. It is all raw, real time from start to finish. Activists and uh, I would say media, uh, corporate press activists, I don't want to call them journalists, will say nothing about my broadcast. The moment a far left extremist chucks a bottle at a cop, they say nothing. When the cop responds, they instantly tweet, police are now beating protesters. They then say, look, he's been live the whole time. This is a live stream of the police unprovoked beating protesters, even though you could have watched the whole thing raw in real time. They wait until only the police are reacting and then blame the police for doing it. Now, now that being said, police have instigated some of these fights of the rights. I've been I'm not saying it's not the case, but what you'll get is there's a, a viral video Occupy Wall Street, their media activists put out where it shows a cop swinging his baton violently, just striking protesters who are holding their hands up. What did they cut from the video? The protesters first hitting the cops and ripping the barricades down and shoving the police to which a cop in panic starts swinging wildly and blindly. Sure. They only show the one thing. A text but, without a context it, is a pretext for trouble. It, it, it's the same thing that Hamas, well, not maybe not Hamas. Well, Hamas does definitely, but I've seen a lot yes. of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, people that attack Israeli soldiers in in Israel, like they'll show the part where the Israeli soldier is like fighting back or, is, you know, is kicking someone, but they don't show that the, the person just tried to knife them or whatever. Sure. And you, that kind of stuff you see coming out of Israel frequently. Look, and I, it, you see the same tactics with the left here. And it's and frustrating it's, as hell to me. And it's, dis and it's a trained, yeah. disciplined rioters with funding, with ass assault groups, with the command group, with drone overwatch. Yeah, you see some yep. some organization to that. Uh, if we had a proper FBI, they'd be figuring out who was behind that. Uh, but to... the FBI is too busy going after Trump supporters. Yeah. So we have major problems. In, but this is why I'm domestic like, problems. I, for one, I don't think we'll see proper security uh, uh, throughout the next year. January 6th, it's laughable that, uh, you know, Media Matters wrote a story claiming that they that it is likely Tim Pool had foreknowledge of January 6th because I had said in September of 2020, Something like the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, and these Trump supporters are going to storm the White House in November. What I was talking about was no one will accept, uh, uh, you know, Trump not winning this election. Of course, nobody stormed the White House in November. But on January 6th, there was the Capitol thing, and they're arguing that was the same thing. The reality was I read the news, and I heard what they were reporting and said, wow, these people are angry. And if this happens, they're going to they're gonna go to D.C. How is it that I was able to say, see that? And law enforcement and the U.S. government was not. I think the reality is they were able to see it and they ignored it. Or depending on how deep you want to go down a rabbit hole, wanted it to happen or facilitated it. Yeah. Well, willful ignorance is still ignorance. Yeah. But I guess what I see with 2024 is, well, the FBI is not going to stop the far left extremists. If anything, they're just going to sit back and watch it happen and cheer for it. They, they don't seem to care at all. But state governments... State authorities have a significant amount of authority and they need to man up and do their jobs. Blue states will allow the violence and the rioting and completely ignore it. And their allies and media will act like it's not happening like we saw in the summer of love. And then when red states do respond properly to deal with the riots, the corporate press will say Trump supporting maggots, that's what they call them, are going full fascist and mercilessly beating peace protesters, rallying people in blue states either because there is a social pressure, a monetary incentive, or an ideological drive to do so. The, the left has deluded themselves into thinking that Trump is Hitler. And so they, they then justify any breach of law to block yeah. Hitler. I, I, I think, you know, when we're talking <clears throat> very early on the show, you said uh, it, it what did you say? Grad you, you effectively said gradually, then suddenly these changes right. happen very, very rapidly. Yeah, I think there may be an inflection point in 2024 where overnight people are just saying it's black and white. So one day you go to sleep, next day you wake up and there's no milk, there's no gas, power's off. That has a, is a, a sad way of, of waking people up. One thing that um, uh, what I've been working on the last three and a half years, really since the nonsense around the last election and seeing big tech throw people off of platforms and silencing and censoring, I said, we need to build a phone that does not have, that's uncancelable. And so we've done that. 
This is a new phone. It's our hardware, our operating system, completely independent of the Google and Apple universe with our own secure messenger as well. Does it use, it uses Android? It's Android based, but it's our hardware, our what, operating system. It doesn't have an advertising ID. It's not capable of having an advertising ID. Wow. And so all the apps that are normally harvesting and exporting your data, um, uh, is blocked by this operating system. Hmm. So you can have an app on here um, and it protects your privacy. What's the name of it? It's called Unplugged. There have been a lot of attempts at uh, phones like this. You know, what? what uh, how's it different? going? If you've heard of, you ever heard of Pegasus? Pegasus uh, is a, a very potent phone virus. Hmm. The guy that developed Pegasus is our CTO. Um, but Pegasus was developed while well, he did it as a way for a phone company to do remote phone service. They send you a text, they click on it, they fix your phone and leave. When it became offensive, he left and built a secure phone. And, and it's Android. Is uh, it's got a front-facing camera. Yep. Is there a light? But but, but that's also a um, it's the first phone with an actual firewall, which you can hard off any of those any of those endpoints so that you control them mm. and uh, no one else can. Does Unplugged have a Twitter account? Um, it's the Up Phone. It's called. Unplugged phone. Yep, unplugged. Yep, that's it. Cool. Privacy center. Is there a indicator for when the front-facing camera is on? Uh, not an indicator, but you have right here, camera blocked. It's off. It's impossible to turn it on. All right. So uh, this is a, this is a, a great story This is hard story code down to, the, down to the root of our operating system. Off is off, on is on. This also even has a, a kill switch here on the side which when you slide it over, it separates the battery from the electronics. No way. Yeah, so <laughs> That's off. a good one. <laughs> so off is off. And the other thing you'll like is on our messenger. But it actually disconnects the contacts? Is that yes. what the, <laughs> it physically separates a, the battery from the electronics. It's, an, it's a physical off switch. Yes. It's, isn't it amazing that we've it's, gotten it's, rid of it's, those? It's like when you used to be able to pull the battery out of the phone. Uh -huh. Same thing. That's what it does. Yeah. The other thing is our messenger has a function called a clear pin data code where if someone says, Tim, give me your phone. I want to inspect your messages. You say, sure. And you unlock it with a certain code and it wipes it. <laughs> Ooh, wipes it down to zero. I love it. So uh, this I, is built off of 15 years wow. of experience of, of abuse of, a, <clears throat> of the regulatory state. This is the, this is the phone which gives people the ability to control their own communications. Well, I gotta when is one. it going to be like available? Um, we just delivered the first 500. I've got 10,000 more coming. And we're ramping up the supply chain. It is made not in China. The nice, but does that mean it's made in America or no? It's not made in America yet. Yeah, but not in China is good. It's a good start. Nope. Uh, the physical battery, the actual physical disconnect for the battery is an absolute. After Occupy Wall Street, my phones could not be turned off. <laughs> yes, I had two phones: I had an Apple and an Android. The Apple, the <coughs> iPhone, you can't remove the battery. The Android, you could. After Occupy Wall Street, I was heavily featured in, you know, a bunch of magazine stuff. I was getting a bunch of followers, getting asked to speak everywhere. And uh, my phones would not turn off. I would turn them off. Instantly, they would both turn back on. Wow. And now, now, why is that? Well, my hacker buddies are like, it's because you're being spied on. Big brother listening. Yeah. And so uh, <clears throat> they have the means to make sure your phone does not shut off. The Android, I pull the battery out. Now it's off. The iPhone, nothing. Can't turn it off. Could not be done. Same sentiment here. So uh, uh, there was a phone that I got a few years ago called, uh, it was, the, it was, I forgot what it was called, the something McLaren. It has a, a, a mechanical front-facing camera that stores itself in the phone. And when you want to use it, it goes, slides out. Hmm. The funny thing about it, my girlfriend was browsing the web and she would notice it would pop up and then go down. Why? Because the websites had code on them to activate the front-facing camera, take a picture and send it to them. So uh, for everybody who is listening, when you're browsing those websites, and you know which ones I'm talking about, they could have a picture of your face. That's why I asked about an indicator. So uh, I don't know if the, the, the uh, I don't know if, uh, I don't Right yeah. here, camera blocked. And, right. And, 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 you, and you can test that when you want to quick catch a, you know, a picture at a sporting event and you try to get to the camera, like camera is no. off per privacy settings. Hmm. So a lot of people will just put tape over their front facing cameras. But now they have a picture of your face. Yeah. yeah. The cool thing about it, though, I will say, there's, 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 and, and you have the option, but uh, the security features that I have for my phone, for instance, is if you try to open it and you don't have the right fingerprint or your code is wrong, takes a picture of your face, sends it to my email. That's cool. Yep. 
So when someone steals your phone and they open it and they, they mess up, it goes picture right I away. I know you're ugly. I see you. Ah, and then you can. We can add that. I know a guy. That's, it's, it's a great feature. <laughs> but you, that would be like if you, you, you know, not everybody's going to turn their camera off. You keep your camera on for quick use at a sporting event and stuff like that. You know, but I do like the uh, mechanical battery separation. That, that's fun. The fact that you can actually confirm that it's turned off is is cool. The fact that that feature is novel is kind of scary. Yeah, look, <clears throat> phones have become uh, basically a digital billboard. And and the, the big guys collect and resell your data to the tune of about $180 a year. They know where you go, what you buy, who you call, and what you browse before even the apps that you put on your phone do more of the same of harvesting and selling that data. I've talked to so many people. <clears throat> they say, man, I was, I was talking to my wife about needing a new mattress mm -hmm. in our bedroom. And the next day they're getting advertising for mattresses. Whoa, talking about it means their phone is listening. This phone does not listen to you. It's incapable of it. The argument that I hear people make when, they're, when you're talking about stuff like that, that phenomenon that everyone is kind of familiar with, I was talking about this thing and then I saw advertisements. Um, I hear it explained as you, your al the algorithms get so good at predicting your your behaviors and stuff and and using the uh using those predictions to select advertisement to go into your feed or whatever that you notice when you talk about something and you see an ad but there's so many ads that go by that you don't notice because you haven't said anything so i don't know if it's you know, Here's I don't the know thing. for sure. It, the, the Atlantic just ran an article. Because it's not that like they don't have the capability to do it, because clearly they do. In an era of AI, um, by the time a kid in America reaches the age of 13, they've um, there's been 72 million data points collected on them. Jesus. It's like digital grooming. Yeah. Uh, so for a parent that is not wanting that for their kid, this is an option. You know, and you, it's, it's, it is hard. It is amazing to realize how much digital exhaust we put off mm -hmm. and in a and how in much a, information that actually is if you have people that are smart enough to read it the right way yes and if you're used to a high trust society it doesn't matter you can maybe get away with that but in a low trust society mm -hmm. then you become a um a controlee mm -hmm. and i don't think um i'm not ready to go there <laughs> no um the the this topic the the, <coughs> the phone algorithms and stuff like that um i had a point that i was going to make and, and i just totally lost it damn it i'm i'm sorry i'm, I'm actually trying to order some of those phones right now <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've put a link I'm up. like I've, phil talk because i'm uh, <laughs> yeah i i like it too i'm 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 thinking i'm thinking i'll probably pick one up too oh uh, you sold me with the mechanical battery the f physical battery thing yeah because you know we've, we've talked with people about making secure phones and it's always uh yeah you know but it's still it's still how do you trust it completely? You don't, but buying a phone with better security is better than nothing. So, but that that right there is what service yeah, does fine. that go on? It, uh, it runs on um, T-Mobile or AT and T, mm -hmm. um, Patriot Mobile, um, and uh, we'll have a a global data roaming sim by and the you, time the next ten thousand. If you're going to talk to your buddy, talk to your buddy about getting it to talk to Starlink too, because ah, well, no, look, it'll it'll connect to any Starlink at anybody's anybody's Wi-Fi, and you can okay, stay yeah. off the stay off it completely sure we also have a uh, a special sim that we can uh, roll the imei mm. to make it very very difficult to track that's cool there you go i just pre-ordered some thank you yeah we uh we had um the guys from freedom phone okay which is a similar uh uh, uh similar concept. effort but that was kind of a reskinned chinese phone and um we've we've tried to learn some of those lessons it, and, and it, I, it wasn't so much about security it was more about cutting yourself off from the woke corporate machine and the tracking of big tech yep this has got more security features the, the issue was that we were trying to order we wanted to do a review of it and we could not i said we can't do a review of it if we accept a phone from you you because then we're getting a potemkin phone basically we have to order it through the normal process and it has to be ordered to someone who's not us and the wait list was too long and we we're never able to actually get it huh. the idea is if we're going to do a legitimate review it's got to be a name they don't know who orders the phone and gets it. Then we get it. I'm like, if you give us a phone, I mean, come on, it's not a real review. It's like, fair enough, you know. So, but uh, you know, for this, I, I ordered it because I want it. The the you you sold me on the you can disconnect the battery contacts from it. I'm like, oh, okay, wow, great, 
off means off. I remember back in the day, my my paranoid hacker buddies throwing their phones, taking the batteries out and throwing it in the freezer and then closing it or turning water on and putting their phone next to it, things like that. Though I don't believe that is as effective as they think it is. Probably. <laughs> yeah. But, but isn't I, it sad that a device we depend on so much in a high trust society can be uh, can be that insidious and used against us? Mm. I think the scarier thing about it is that kids who are growing up today will think it's normal. Oh. The, it's normal to be tracked 24-7, to be spied on. It's Orwellian. I remember yeah. reading 1984, in 1984, <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I spent my seventh birthday in East Berlin in 1976, wow. and seeing the guns and the dogs and the minefields and everything, literally holding people in East Germany, not letting them leave a national prison colony. I thought, what the hell? This is not this this... Bolshevik thing is not not it. I will say it, it's going to be uh, what's the right word? I would say funny, but the circumstances of conflict aren't funny. But you know, funny maybe the right word when in 2024 all the far leftists and all the right wingers are all using your phones because <laughs> it's like it doesn't matter if you're left, right, up, down, whatever. It's a secure phone, and that's what we have to use. So it's like Antifa has got the unplugged phone. A free people require the ability to communicate securely and freely. Yeah. We also have a really good VPN, which works everywhere in the world. And I, when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere. Hmm. I, I, I need to get one of these. What, what, do, what, what triggered this uh, desire to make a phone? He's the nonsense around the 2020 election. Oh wow. <laughs> they're, uh, they're pulling up Google searches for some of these guys, and I got to be honest, it's actually kind of. I'm sorry, it's funny. One guy on January 4th searched for gas mask. Then on the 5th, searched for can I bring gas mask on plane. <laughs> then on the 6th, they searched for pepper spray, washing pepper spray off. And then on like the 7th, they searched Capitol Riot, you know, Capitol Police. And it's just like, we know exactly what you're thinking, bro, before, during, and after. Dude, all of your Google searches, all of them. I I'm sorry. You think incognito mode is protecting you? It's not. No. <laughs> right. But they tell you this too. And like you open private tabs or whatever, it's like, this won't record in your computer, but they are still spying on you. Yeah. It's if, if someone's looking at your IP. It's and Google controls IP. 90 some percent of search. The, the, you know, the, the US government broke up Standard Oil when they controlled 90% of hydrocarbons. Google must be broken up. I make this point frequently. Wow. It's be, I don't Easily know. enforce antitrust laws. Please read the book, The Myth of Capitalism. Eric, by Jonathan Tepper. Eric, you 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 know as well as I do that they're not going to do that because all they have to do is subpoena the data that Google collects, and then the government and, and the Google does the the job the government wishes that it could do. And if, if they subpoena that information, they get the information. So you no. know, the, Google is just another you're right, another you're right. part of the, in, uh, the military industrial complex. You, you are you are correct. They could, but the reason why Google will not be broken up is not that, although. It is very useful for the uh, security state and the bureaucratic state to utilize Google as a weapon for themselves. The real issue is that any, the moment any politician stands up and says, we need to break up Google, Google presses a button and every default search turns into politician is pedophile. Yeah. Either that or the guy from the CIA comes with a picture of JFK. I'm, I'm not, I don't even think, uh, Google, uh, uh, like the stuff we saw from Dr. Robert Epstein, you familiar with his work? He, uh, around COVID, right? No, no, no. He's he's tracking uh, big tech manipulating elections. Okay. And he said there was a so they 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 find that these big tech companies are actually interfering. Uh, one example was Democrats on Facebook one hundred percent received a reminder to go vote, but only sixty nine percent of Republicans received a reminder to go vote. <laughs> That's how you rig an election. Mm -hmm. Sure. And it's, it's as simple as, well, it's not my fault. I Like, I'm allowed to speak as a corporation. I can tell Democrats to Republicans of, not to. Those kind of things, when, when applied to 350 million people the, around the edges, oh, yeah. will, can change the, the behavior of people, and that can change an election. He, he said How he found— How many did Trump, Trump lose by a, a, allegedly? 44,000. 44,000 overall? He, he said he found in, I think it was Georgia, that uh, it was Ted Cruz wrote a letter saying, we see what you're doing, here's the data— Instantly, in their in 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 their uh, testing metrics, they saw the manipulation machine turn off, and instantly the bias went to zero. So the favorability of Democrat gone. These politicians know that it's not even it's not even about the fear. 
It's not even the stick. It could be the carrot. You're a politician. You go to Google and say, listen, I'm not going to message you guys. I'm, I will block antitrust. I'm a fan of what Google does. And they're going to go loud and clear. The next thing you know, the next next day, Google search is all politician is a hero. Why politician is the best. Why politician should be elected. And that's all anyone sees. And it's all the posts they receive. They go on YouTube. What do they see on the front page? Politician is good, dude. Yeah. That's why they say it's a republic if we can keep it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> This has been fun. Uh, next week, I, it was funny. There was someone in chat who was like, this is obviously a pre-record because Tim and Phil are wearing the same clothes. First of all, I wear the same thing every day. I have like two outfits. This is a different shirt. <laughs> it's the same color though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Next week, however, is a pre-record. Uh, we sat down with Shane Cashman and Alex Rosen. Uh, they they do some crazy work tracking down child abusers. And so we did pre-record this one. That'll be up next Friday because we are off for Christmas. So thank you all so much. Make sure you subscribe to Tenet Media. Subscribe to this channel. You can follow me personally at TimCast. Eric, do you want to shout anything out other than your phone or maybe your phone? Unplugged.com. Great for Christmas. Great. Yeah. I ordered I ordered a couple. Pre-order. When do they when do they ship? Uh they should be here late February. Right on. By Sound. then we'll by then we'll be in inventory and able to, to quick ship. Sounds good. Thanks for hanging out. Phil, did you want to mention anything before we go? I am uh, Phil That Remains on Twitter. I'm Phil That Remains Official on Instagram. The band is All That Remains. You can follow us on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, YouTube, you know, the internet. Oh, I am on Twitter now, too. Oh, sick. What is it? Real Eric D. Prince. Everybody's putting real in front of their names now. I had to because there's like eight imposters right. that taking all the, every other aspect of my name. I, real E R I K D Prince. I think that's, I think Trump started that, though, because for, for that reason, when he, when he goes on Twitter, there's a bunch of fake ones. Yep. So he's like, I'm the real one. And now there's so many people who have real, you're the real one. But uh, right on, man. Uh, I appreciate the, the conversation. Thanks for hanging out. For everybody who is uh, watching, thank you all so much. We'll be back tonight over at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see y'all then.